and welcome to my top 10 movies of 2023 uh finally <laughs> and i'm starting off by talking about a film i seen uh pretty late actually just today um i love jessica chastain i think she's gonna end up being one of the greatest of all time she is already in my opinion um i just haven't had a chance to see memory until recently as it finally played somewhere within driving distance of myself um it's a very low-key, very human, very, you know, somewhat depressing, you know, drama given the subject matter. Um, but it's very real world. It might be, you know, per se, boring to some people. But if you love acting and you love, like, studies on human behavior, uh, this is definitely that. It has to do with uh, Peter Sarsgaard's character having, uh, you know, dementia and stuff like that. Um, Jessica Chastain sort of character sort of sort of sorting through her you know own history and it's it's really nicely done like i said a very low-key drama won't be for everyone but definitely something i i really deeply appreciate loving the craft as i do um since i've seen it so late i'm not able to put an exact number on it but i just know it would definitely be somewhere in my top 10 top 15 of the year so i definitely wanted to mention that and let it be known that it's in that range and kicking off the rest of my top 10 is No Hard Feelings. Now, I've always liked Jennifer Lawrence, never been like her number one fan necessarily, but I gotta say I was so pleasantly surprised how much I enjoyed No Hard Feelings. Uh, one of my favorite two comedies of the year. Um, a really surprising amount of uh, chemistry between Jennifer Lawrence and uh, Andrew Barth Feldman, who did a really nice job himself. Uh, probably one of the most memorable fight scenes of the year on the beach. If you guys seen it, you know what I'm talking about. Uh, Jennifer Lawrence did a really nice job with her comedic timing. It felt really organic. And just, you know, one of those feel-good movies that I think, uh, I need a dose of once in a while. At number nine is Subspecies 5, Blood Rise. Uh, this is a new film in the very cult, uh, Full Moon Features series which I've always been a, an adamant fan of for a long time now. Uh, I even had the pleasure of interviewing Denise Duff a few years ago. Um, they bring back Anders Hove, who uh, is in his, I believe, 70s, and he still plays the role as well as he usually would from the 90s. Um, it explores Radu's origins a bit, um, which I think is nicely handled, uh, and Anders does a really commendable job at portraying that. Um, they make it make sense to the lore and the timeline and everything, and, uh, yeah, just one of them that gives me pleasure to talk up a little bit during a video like this. Number eight is Indiana Jones and the Dial of Destiny, which, uh, I ended up seeing with my parents, so he had that, a, r a really good experience seeing this with them. Um, Harrison Ford does a gr as great of a job as always. I know this one didn't go over that well with, uh, at least a portion of the audience, but I, for one, really, really enjoyed it. It's probably one of my two favorites of the franchise. I know, kill me, but it's my take. Um, even how they sort of tie into what happened with you know, Shia LaBeouf's character from the previous film, I thought it was about as nicely done as it could have been. Uh, Harrison Ford actually gives a performance in a particular scene that did make me tear up a little bit. The Avenger itself I had a lot of fun with. Uh, Fever, Phoebe Waller-Bridge I liked. Um... People having an issue with her character have particular issues of their own. Um, she and Ford played off of each other well, both help each other, both sort of, uh, you know, bicker with each other. I thought it was a decent dynamic. Um, Mads Mikkelsen, while I think he could have been given more knowing how talented of a bastard he is, um, still in a very fitting role and good to have in the film. And it leaves the franchise off and the character played by Ford in a really, really good place that I think was pretty resonant. And at number seven is It's a Wonderful Knife. You know, I don't see a lot of movies more than once while they're in theaters, unless it's, well, a Godzilla movie, or just something I haven't enjoyed that much and want to have someone else see with me. Um, that being the case with this, I've seen it myself, and I just had to show it to my wife as well. And it's really just because I enjoyed it that much, man. It has fun enough with the concept, uh, but the two leads, Jane Woodup and uh, Jess McLeod, uh, she and they both do really, really well. And have like this really nice and sweet, genuine chemistry with each other. Um, also because one of my all-time favorite people and actresses, Catherine Isabel, is a part in this. Um, you know, she really steals the scenes that she's in. Uh, Justin Long, of course. Um, 
you know, so it has that fun to it, but it has that bit of introspective look at just the right times and really hits home with a pretty uh, beautiful moment and, uh, you know, message in terms of uh, why those two ladies I said are both kind of intersecting, um, both for, you know, personal reasons and reasons that connect. But yeah, I just really enjoyed this movie a lot and it should definitely be talked about more often. And number six is Boudicca, Queen of War. I almost had this in my top five. Um, you know, I had to sort of, uh, you know, split some hairs. Uh, you know, I had some minor issues with, you know, some of the smaller or supporting performances being a little bit uneven, um, as well as some of the choreography not being as, you know, creative as it could have been. Um, but nonetheless, Olga Kurlenko is another one of my favorite actresses, and she really drives this as far as it got. Um, and really, it could be in my top five very well. And she's definitely one of the top five performances I've seen all year. Um, she just has this fierceness and, you know, genuine heart and raw sort of grief that's really portrayed nicely with the character by her. Um, the story itself and the production of it looks better than it has any right to, um, given it does not have like a $200 million budget. Um, Jesse V. Johnson as director is one of the you know, best modern action directors, and he shows that again here for the most part. Um, it has a very specific direction it goes in that you'll probably see coming, but it nonetheless, uh, again, it hits home with it, especially thanks to Curry Lenko, and it definitely deserves being at least number six. And finally, my top five of the year starts off with John Wick Chapter 4. Just when I thought I was out, they pulled me back in. I enjoyed all three previous John Wick movies, but I was getting a little bit bored of it to a point where oh, they're just doing action sequences for the sake of action sequences. They lost some of that initial weight and sort of flavor and story engagement that the first one had. Um, as much as I like the third one, don't get me wrong. But Chapter 4, let me tell you, they, they proved me wrong. Um, they really follow through with... Uh, kind of the overall direction of, uh, you know, the organization and everything that they've been building for three movies. Uh, Bill Skarsgård and uh, Donnie Yen uh, are probably the two best villains in the franchise. They sort of circle back to uh, John Wick's point of his story really nicely, I thought. Um, Ian McShane, of course, of course, little late, uh, Lance Reddick. The action is as good as ever. It feels like it has a purpose again. It feels like we're really working towards something. And it has probably my favorite finale and climax of the series. Um, now that it's the greatest spectacle of the series, just that it's a really fitting sort of a Western style thing that I think was uh, really appropriate and really, just really done in an awesome way, for lack of a better way to say it right now for some reason. But yeah, John Wick Chapter 4, it's as good as it gets. Number four is Renfield. I'm a big Nicolas Cage fan, so of course it was a treat for me to see him play Dracula, as he wanted to in the past, and he does a really great job with it. That classical mix with his own Nick Cage flavor. Um, this was uh, definitely that other comedy I was referring to when I talked about No Hard Feelings. Definitely one of my favorite on that end of the year, as well as the next one I'm talking about to a different extent as well. Um, but it's just bloody and just fun all over with that bit of a mix of a, uh, you know, toxic, you know, symbiotic relationship of it that uh, Renfield is trying to get out of. Maybe the best I've ever seen Nicholas Holt alongside the menu, perhaps. Uh, like I said, Nicholas Cage is great in the movie. I personally liked Aquafina's part too. Um, and yeah, I, I could not ask for, for a better version of this. Number four. And number three is Poor Things. Yes, it's just as good as you've been hearing. Emma Stone has always been an actress I like a lot, and my, my uh, like definitely grows into love as the years go on, it seems. Um, she is definitely one of probably the best performances of the year. Uh, hopefully I'll be doing a video on that before too long. Uh, just such versatility in her performance here from the emotion you're expecting. But she plays maybe the most unique lead of the year, too, that would be challenging for any actor. But she pulls it off in spades, and unlike anyone else, uh, I, I said this is a bit of a comedy a couple minutes ago. And it is. It's, it has that dark comedy side to it, but then also that really unique type of character study. But yeah, Poor Things, it, it's, a, it's an artsy, very weird movie. Um, 
but nothing like it you'll see all year and it's worthy of all the attention it's getting.